Hello, Richard from BudgetGuitars.com. This video is about 10 tips for using backing tracks, and specifically this is for solo performers, not for like group performances, so not like a praise and worship setup, but just like one musician, one performer on the stage. And these tips are basically just my opinion. I'm not putting this out there as the gospel of Richard. I'm not saying they're universal truths. This is just stuff that makes sense to me. So number one, learn to make your own backing tracks. Now, this is kind of a big ask for some people. Yes, you can buy backing tracks online, but if you're really serious about this and you take the time to learn how to make your own uh, you will be rewarded. You have the most control. You can use whatever you've got. You can improve your tracks over time. You can start with just MIDI files you can download. And it makes it easy to put songs in a different key. And that's super important unless you're like a, a tenor or something. And it does require a lot of skill. But if you don't have those skills, maybe you have a friend who's really into recording. But this is really, really powerful if you can make your own. If you can't, you're at the mercy of whatever you can buy online. Two, start with a MIDI file. So if you Google the song title, like I Keep Forgetting by Michael McDonald, with the word MIDI after it, you can download a file and you can open that up in your DAW, keep the bass and the drums, get rid of almost everything else. I've got a bunch of tips on here, so you can pause the video and write this down if you really want to. I'm not really going to spend too much time talking about this, but basically you can use that MIDI track as a starting point. And if nothing else, usually the drums are pretty good, although you can replace the drums with like better sounding drums, but it's a good starting point. So you don't always have to start from scratch. It'll usually have the correct tempo also. Three, do not try to sound like the album with your backing track. If you go see a live show, it doesn't sound like the CD. The drums are always mixed louder. And the bass drum is something you can feel because of all the subwoofers. That's what gives the energy and the excitement. So you want to simulate the sound of a real band, uh, not the sound of a CD, because if you simulate the sound of a CD, you're going to sound like karaoke, but somebody playing an instrument, right? It's just, it's the wrong mix. It, you know, what sounds good on a CD is not going to sound good live. The drums need to be louder in the mix, more excitement, right? So... You don't want to include every little element, you know, and make it sound just like the song. What you want to do is try to simulate something that is what a live band would sound like. And frankly, if you can get away with just drums and bass, that's like the best. Okay, four, add a 12 or 15 inch powered subwoofer to your PA, because if people can feel the kick drum, that's something that's not going to happen. In, in most cases with like a solo performer. Most solo performers are a dude with an acoustic guitar. It's not enough just to have drums. If their drums have a lot of low end and people can like really feel it, you will go a long way towards sounding like an actual band. So in the long run, it'd be cool if you can separate out all the different stems, you know, and mix them. But in the short run, just mix your background tracks so that when you play it through your PA with a sub, it sounds like a live band, like a live drummer and a live bass player. And then you add your guitar and your voice or your keyboard and you're where you need to be. It'll sound awesome. Five, test every mix at loud volumes. So all your backing tracks should be mixed around the same volume level and you need to crank your PA up so like what it's going to be at a gig and really check your mixes. Is that kick drum sound like a live drum set? You know, how does it sound? You don't want to have big volume changes between your tracks from one tune to another. Because all that's going to do is highlight the fact that it's a backing track. Believe it or not, if you're really nailing it and the drums and bass are coming off the computer, people will forget after a while that there's not a drummer and a bass player up there unless the backing tracks are constantly getting louder and softer. 
So you really got to crank your PA up and match the volume of all the backing tracks with each other. Most DAWs make that pretty easy. Six, no fade outs, right? Your backing track should not fade out. This should be obvious. That's just going to look stupid. Live bands don't do that. Don't do fade outs. Seven, avoid backing vocals if possible. If, if people hear singing in the background track, it can make people more notice that it's a backing track. It kind of destroys the illusion. It's also really hard to get background vocals at the right volume level. They're either going to be too soft or too loud. And the more stuff you add to a mix, the more elements, the more obvious it is that most of the music isn't being performed live. And you don't want you don't want people to focus on that because again, that's karaoke, right? I think there's also this deal where if they hear your voice like coming out of the speakers and you're not singing, they might also doubt when you're singing, are you really singing? Maybe I'm being paranoid, but to me it's just a bad look. And uh sometimes you don't have a choice, but ninety nine times out of a hundred, if you have a choice, just don't do it. This can also influence your song choice, you know? I wouldn't try to cover the Beach Boys as one person with a lot of backing vocals. It would just look stupid. Eight, improve your tracks over time. So if you're making your own backing tracks, one thing you can do over time is, for example, replace the keyboard bass with like a real recorded bass. And uh, if you get like better drum samples, better drum sounds, use those. The cool thing about having your own backing tracks is that you can make them better and better over time. If you discover, hey, it's a little too fast or too slow, you can adjust it. Nine, mix the cymbals very quiet. Cymbals are annoying. They're annoying in real life. They're annoying in recordings. There are certain artists like Peter Gabriel who, who recorded several albums with no cymbals at all. So I think that you have to have cymbals in your mix to make it sound like, like a real song, but mix them really soft. Like the bass drum should be loud and the snare drum should be kind of loud. And the cymbals should be, I don't know, in my opinion, I like to bury them. Because once you crank that PA up and it's really loud, that recorded cymbal or cymbal hit is, it's harsh. I mean, let's, let's face it, cymbals are harsh. So mix them quiet. And 10, finally, learn Ableton Live. Now, this is not required. You can use any DAW, but Ableton Live has some advantages. So you can get the uh, intro version for 99 bucks. It's a little different. It's The learning curve is a little steep at the beginning, but once you learn it, it's super easy to use. It's available on Mac or Windows. In my experience, it is the most CPU-efficient live DAW. And so... You don't really have to worry about Ableton Live crashing on you like you might with some other DAWs. You can trigger patch changes, run DMX lights, play your backing tracks. And on the Mac, it works great with MainStage. So MainStage is like a, a cheap software program that comes with amazing drums and synths and stuff. And if you try to use that with Logic, uh, you can run into big time problems live. So on the Mac, the combination of Ableton Live plus main stage is pretty hard to beat and it's very cost efficient. Now having said all this, can you use other DOS? Yes. Will they work just as well? Probably. It just depends on your computer. But Ableton Live is sort of like the standard for, for doing live music, including backing tracks. A lot of praise and worship uh, situations use Ableton Live for a reason. It's really good at it super CPU efficient, rock solid, bulletproof. Okay, so this has been a super, super short video. There's a lot more to cover. I mean, the whole process of making your own backing track is, that could be like a college course. You know, and I know this is a little bit of a cop out, like, well, just make your own. But honestly, if you've got a computer and if you've got a MIDI keyboard and you know where the notes are, you can do it. You can definitely do it. At some point in time, I might make a video on how to do it, but I don't know if that would be interesting enough to my audience. If you want to see a video like that, put it in the comments section. I would definitely consider it. 
I definitely feel like I went too quick. Like one of the tips that I didn't say out loud that I wish I had is if you're using like a keyboard bass sound, do yourself a favor and go like cut a lot of the high end and it'll just come out kind of kind of boomy sounding and sound a lot more like a like a real bass you know a bass that wasn't recorded super well but a real bass if you leave the attack in like the little click or whatever it's going to be a dead giveaway that it's like midi bass so that's a really good tip there's a lot of other good tips but again this is just a quickie overview I've been using backing tracks for years, and I've learned some of this stuff the hard way. Hope you found this helpful. You can leave a comment. You can email me at richard at budgetguitars.com. Thanks for watching, and I will see you again next Friday at 5.